Okay, uh, continuing with part two of chapter six. So now let's look at something called ejection fraction. Uh, this is the only ratio that we will discuss in chapter six, so it's gonna be an easier definition to remember. Uh, what ratio are we looking at? So the amount of blood that's available in the heart to be pumped compared to the actual blood that was pumped by the ventricles. So we have our equation, so stroke volume divided by N diastolic volume, and we can see that right here. So what is our stroke volume? So we already know that every time the ventricles contract, they are ejecting a certain amount of blood out. So that's what we put on top here, amount of blood that was pumped out by the ventricles. And then we take what's on the bottom, total amount of blood that was available. We already said that we don't pump all the blood that's available out in, a, in our stroke volume. Um, and when we take that ratio between the two, that gives us ejection fraction. So uh, here is uh, an example problem. So we said kind of an average stroke volume is 70 milliliters. That's what we pumped out. But what did we have available to be pumped? It was more than that. It was 110 milliliters. So we divide, um, and if you want to get your calculator out just so you can see how this is done, you would do 70 divided by 110. That gives you a decimal. It gives you a 0.636. But anytime we see a decimal, we're gonna put it into a percent. So it gives us roughly, you know, you could do 63.6 or round it to about 64%. So an average ejection fraction is somewhere around 60. So 60 to 65 considered normal. What does this represent? So increased ejection fraction represents increased ventricular function. It means our left ventricle is efficient when we have a greater ejection fraction. What's considered abnormal? Less than about 50%. We're gonna watch a video, they may give a different variable, but it's somewhere around 50% or less. Um, it just means the myocardial contractivity is compromised. So this is a lack of blood pumped to the body, which results in a decreased oxygen delivery, which results in something called ischemia. So it's just lack of oxygen to an organ or tissue. So if our ejection fraction is less than 60, or sorry, less than 50%, it means that only uh, half of what was filled left the chamber. Um, and that's not enough blood getting to our organs and our muscle tissue. Uh, what about during exercise? So what happens to ejection fraction? Um, highly trained ejection fraction is going, or sorry, in the highly trained athletes, ejection fraction is going to be very high, roughly around 90%. Um, so if we think normal at rest is about 60, uh, think about during exercise, that's increased. Why is that increased? Because our heart is pumping faster and it's contracting um, more forcefully. So increased contractility will result in a greater stroke volume and a greater stroke volume will result in a greater ejection fraction. So all the way up to about 90% in our trained. Proper care and treatment. Whoops. All right, so um, let's continue. So just a quick video there. Um, now we want to talk about another variable or a mechanism called the Frank Starling mechanism. So we have kind of our basic definition right here. Um, venous return or venous return. We kind of already discussed. Um, it's the blood flow coming back to the heart from the body. So think about when an increase in venous return. We have more blood being pumped back when it fills into those chambers, um, it's gonna stretch the ventricles, causing a reactionary increase. Um, where's that increase? It's in the contractile force of the ventricle. So venous return is basically the rate of blood flow back to the heart. Venous return increases with exercise. Uh, as the muscles contract forcefully and pump blood back to the heart at a greater rate. Uh, so this is due to vasoconstriction of the organs. This is called the muscle pump, where the muscles are forcing blood back to the heart. 
Uh, so this stretching of the ventricular fibers beyond normal will result in an additional power for more forceful contractions due to that optimal stretch. Uh, this is due to increased sympathetic stimulation, increased ventricular contractility of the myocardium. So when we have an increase in venous return, what is going to be lower now? Increased venous return will result in increased contractile force of the ventricles, meaning if we had more blood being pumped out of the heart, we're going to have a lower in systolic volume because our stroke volume was greater. So let's talk about some questions here. So if blood pressure in the aorta increases, stroke volume decreases. Why does that happen? So if we think about blood pressure, what does that mean? Um, if blood pressure is higher, it's due to some sort of resistance causing extra pressure. So we talked about atherosclerosis or any type of constriction of a vessel. Um, but this is talking specifically at the aorta. So if blood pressure um, is increased, stroke volume decreases, meaning that there's not enough blood or a decreased amount of blood that can be pumped through the aorta. That's gonna decrease blood flow to the entire body um, de and then resulting in that decrease in um, oxygen delivery. If blood pressure in an artery is high, um, ejection fraction into that artery also decreases. So results in a decreased ejection fraction, which we know is the percent of blood leaving the heart. This is due to that resistance to flow. Um, it's gonna affect the amount of blood that can be pumped out. Basically, the heart's not able to supply enough oxygen. We'll discuss blood pressure in more detail in a later lecture, um, but we probably already understand it a little bit. Um, anytime there's pressure, it's due to some sort of resistance. And if there's a resistance, it means there's a decrease in blood flow, meaning the heart is not able to pump enough blood to the organs or the muscles, decreasing oxygen delivery. Let's talk about the role of exercise here. How does exercise actually help this? Um, so with exercise, we know it's going to decrease blood pressure at rest and increase volume of the ventricles, allowing the body to receive adequate blood flow. Exercise also results in um, greater elasticity of our arteries. So if they're more elastic, it means they can stretch more. If they can stretch more, then uh, it's less likely going to have higher blood pressures at rest and during exercise. So if there's decreased blood pressure, there's an increased ability to deliver blood and oxygen to working muscle. All right, so these next few slides will discuss how is stroke volume increased? What causes that? So we have our diagram here, um, and we look at the kind of the end result is having a greater stroke volume. What factors cause this? So we're first gonna discuss how an increase in end diastolic volume or preload allows for this. So first we have to recall the definition of end diastolic volume, which is right there. Uh, volume in the or volume of blood in the ventricles after that relaxation phase or after the filling. Um, we have that word preload, which is the stretching of ventricles to greater dimensions. If the ventricle or ventricular fibers stretch to greater dimensions, it means they're going to snap back faster, um, increasing contractility. So the force at which the ventricles contract. And if there's a greater force of contraction, the ventricles are going to be able to eject more blood. Um, so we kind of mentioned contractility. So that's kind of the second factor. Greater end diastolic volume results in greater contractility. So the strength of the ventricular contraction. Um, again, this is just due to the stretching. So um, greater stretching of the ventricles results in a more forceful contraction, again, ejecting more blood. And then the last we see right here is total peripheral resistance is decreased. So let's discuss first what peripheral resistance is. Um, so basically it's vascular resistance, which is the resistance that must be overcome to push blood through the circulatory system and create flow. It has to do with pressures. 
So it's basically, and we can see there, pressure the heart must kind of overcome to eject blood. We mentioned that earlier as the afterload. This is determined by sympathetic activity and blood viscosity, which is the thickness of our blood. Uh, that's gonna increase our resistance to flow, which we don't want. We don't want an increased resistance. So when there's a decrease in peripheral resistance, so less resistance, we have greater flow. So we have greater stroke volume. The heart's able to overcome that resistance and eject more blood. So these are kind of our three main factors that increase stroke volume. But let's go into some more detail about the end diastolic volume. So again, we're just kind of starting with each one of these. So in diastolic volume, again, is preload, which is the stretching of the ventricular fibers to greater dimensions. Let's talk about how do those fibers stretch. We have to remember this Frank Starling mechanism or Frank Starling law, which is an increase in venous return is going to stretch the ventricular fibers. So here we have greater stretch equals greater strength of contraction. So those fibers are going to stretch and they're going to snap back faster, resulting in a more forceful pump. Let's talk about what happens with a decrease in heart rate. So if we have a decrease in heart rate, we have more time for blood to fill those chambers. Um, if we think about what controls heart rate, um, partly intrinsic and then extrinsic control. So intrinsic control controls the rate at which uh, the ventricles will fill with blood. So if that signal for the heart to contract is slowed down, that means we have greater time to fill those ventricles, meaning we have an increase in our preload, which, sees here, or which we see here is filling time. So we have greater filling time with a decrease in heart rate. Uh, if we have more filling time, we can fill up those ventricles more if they fill greater or fill up more, we have an increase in stretch. Again, increase in stretch is gonna increase the strength of that contraction. And so that's where we are kind of down here. Next is venous return. We kind of already talked about with the Frank Starling law, venous return increases preload, the stretch of the ventricles to greater dimensions. And then we have another word, venoconstriction. Uh, venoconstriction is when our veins are compressed. So you think this may be a bad thing, uh, but if you think about venoconstriction and working muscle, every time those, mu or those veins constrict, they're propelling blood back to the heart. This is due to the skeletal muscle pump, which we'll look at on the next slide. So venoconstriction, think about exercise or just think about movement in general. Um, when those muscles contract, they squeeze. And when they squeeze, they're compressing those ventricles, or sorry, they're compressing those veins. So every time a vein is compressed, it's pumping blood back up to the heart. That increases our venous return. So here's our skeletal muscle pump here. So skeletal muscle pump, we have our definition, is our rhythmic contractions forcing blood in our extremities toward the heart through the valves of those veins. Um, this increases with exercise, kind of like I mentioned, because now those muscles are contracting more so, propelling more blood back to the heart. So we know valves are one-way valves. So this key, the reason they're one way um, or one direction keeps that blood separate. So these one-way valves keep blood pumping back to the heart, preventing any backflow of blood. So we look in this picture right here. Um, this is when a muscle is relaxed. So when a muscle is relaxed, uh, we see there's you know blood flowing back to the heart from our veins. But now in this picture, he did a calf raise. So with this calf raise, that muscle expanded, it contracted, and when it contracted, it compressed this vein. You think, well, if it's compressing the vein, we're not getting blood flow back to the heart. But think about if we do these contractions over and over again, as if with running. Um, now we're constantly ejecting blood back to the heart faster. So we have this rapid propelling of blood. Uh, to the heart, which is basically just venous return. 
And if we have an increase in venous return, we have an increase in end diastolic volume, which is the filling of those ventricles. If we have a greater end diastolic volume, we're gonna have an increase in stroke volume, which if we have an increased stroke volume, we're gonna have a decrease in end systolic volume. Besides the venous valves, the so-called muscle pump also plays an important role in transporting blood against the pull of gravity. The large veins in the leg are surrounded by muscles that tense and thicken when we walk. This muscle action presses on the veins and pumps the blood upwards. When the muscles relax again, the venous valves prevent the blood from flowing backwards, as described above. All right, so let's kind of continue um, talking about contractility now and how ventricular contractility increases stroke volume. So here we see the contraction of our heart mediated by our uh, sympathetic nervous system. So that's what SNS is referring to. So our sympathetic nervous system um, increasing contractility. So how is it increasing contractility? Uh, basically having to do with sympathetic hormones. So epinephrine and norepinephrine, so our adrenaline. Um, when we have an increase in these hormones, it increases the rate at which the SA node fires. And if we have an increased rate of SA node firing, um, we're gonna have a kind of faster heart rate. And when this heart rate's faster, um, it's going to eject kind of more blood at a faster rate. And so that's basically what it says right here. Um, circulating epinephrine, norepinephrine, that's going to eventually end up increasing our ejection fraction. By increasing ventricular emptying, we have decreased residual volume. And if we have decreased residual volume, which is the volume left over, means we have an increased ejection fraction. So you remember what the definition of ejection fraction was, the ratio of available blood pumped to the actual blood that we le that left the heart. Um, so more blood is able to be pumped out when we have increased sympathetic stimulation. Let's talk about how training um, can also increase these factors. So let's first talk about plasma volume. Um, plasma volume is the watery component of our blood. Um, and when we have an increase in plasma volume, um, it's mainly due, well, it's due to a few factors, but what we're referring to is exercise induced, so with training. This is called hypervolemia. Uh, hypervolemia, uh, hyper meaning excessive, volemia referring to volume. So hypervolemia um, is expansion of the blood volume due to increase in plasma. So if we have an increase in plasma volume, uh, we have an increase in total blood volume. And if we have an increase in total blood volume, we're gonna have more blood filled into the ventricles. Um, again, this can be due to Frank Starling mechanism, which is an increase in venous return. Now we have more blood being pumped back to the heart. So this is going to stretch those ventricular fibers and result in greater contractile force, resulting in a greater stroke volume. So ET, um, that's going to be endurance training. So endurance training uh, increases in diastolic volume. So how does this happen? Due to increased contractility. Uh, let's talk about um, endurance training just kind of as a whole. It's going to result in a decreased heart rate at rest. But in order to maintain the same cardiac output of around like 4.8 to 5 liters per minute, uh, we have to have an increase in stroke volume. So increase in stroke volume um, is going to basically decrease our end systolic volume. So if we have increase in diastolic volume, again, that means we have more blood filled into the ventricles. If we have more blood in the ventricles, we have more blood available to be pumped. So we're gonna have an increase in stroke volume and ejection fraction. What's gonna result or what's going to decrease is systolic volume. There's going to be less blood in the ventricles after systole. 
So let's continue with talking about trained versus untrained. So these are just some variables that occur during exercise. So let's talk about stroke volume. We already know that it increases with exercise um, and it increases as we start working harder. So imagine, let's say aerobic exercise, you're running. Uh, you start running and slowly increasing your intensity and that stroke volume is going to increase as you work harder, but only up until about 40 to 50% of your VO2 max. So you wanna think about that as about um, what are, sub maximal, so like sub maximal, like 50% of your effort basically. Uh, so with this, uh, stroke volume will actually start to plateau. So stroke volume will level off at 40 to 50% of VO2 max. What about heart rate? So heart rate has a linear increase with exercise intensity. So that's why heart rate is a good indicator of how hard we're working. People, a lot of people train um, in heart rate zones. So heart rate will increase and it will continue to increase all the way up until we reach our maximal exercise. Cardiac output will do the same. So heart rate and cardiac output increase until we basically cannot go any harder. So 90, 95% of our VO2 max, our heart rate will keep increasing and same with cardiac output. So max heart rate is determined by age. Um, so the ability of your heart to reach maximal levels is due to basically how old you are. That equation, 220 minus your age, um, is kind of a generic and kind of a very simple way to get max, maximal heart rate. Cardiac output, we already said, will increase um, based on your heart rate and your stroke volume, but also up until about 20 to 30 liters um, per minute of blood being, or per um, amount of blood being pumped per minute. So that's all we have for part two, uh, and we'll start part three.